Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryan over there, and Jerry's right over there, uh, internet speaking wise. And this is Stuff You Should Know, a special holiday edition that comes out on the holiday, Chuck. <laughs> now, is this, can we call this a holiday? Yeah, Groundhog Day is definitely a holiday. Are you people, not a pagan? <laughs> well, no, I just thought holidays meant like work, you don't work and business is closed. I, there's got to be somebody that's closed on Groundhog Day. <laughs> well, I bet certain people in a certain town, well, actually, they're probably, everything's open. Cause it's got to be. They're, they're just doing this to make money. <laughs> right. They would be total fools if they're like, yeah, I always close on Groundhog yeah. Day. <laughs> oh, I didn't think that through. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we'll get to that town in a little bit. But first, Chuck, let's talk about groundhogs themselves. Because if you don't know what Groundhog Day is, don't worry. This isn't one of those ones where we need to define it for you. Just kick back and relax and, like, let us guide you down the river of knowledge. <laughs> okay? Not All right. Well. Uh, groundhogs, a.k.a. woodchucks, Fact a.k.a. Fact of the podcast. <laughs> whistle pigs. Yeah. Other facts. It's another name. They are... Uh, you know what they are. They're beautiful. Um, they weigh 12 to 15 pounds. They live, put a pin in this stat, they live six to eight years. Mm-hmm. That'll come back later. Uh, they eat veggies and fruits. Uh, they're called whistle pigs sometimes because they whistle if they're scared yeah. or if they're looking for a mate. It's more of a chirping can, sound to me. Yeah. But chirping pigs is not as fun as whistle pig. That explains that high-end bourbon, though. I had no idea why... It was called Whistle Pig, but it's named after I Groundhogs. Whistle Pig. Is that high end? Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. It's the kind they uh, keep behind the counter. <laughs> you know? Well, it's on my shelf. I don't drink a lot of bourbon, but. Oh, well, go turn it up right now while we're recording right. this. And <laughs> tell us what you think. All right. I'm back and I'm hammered, everyone. Good. Uh, they can climb trees, they can swim, mm-hmm. And they hibernate in late fall, and this is kind of one of the important parts of yeah. woodchucks and groundhogs and how they figure into Groundhog Day. Uh, they hibernate in the fall, and their body temperatures drop. That heartbeat slows down from uh, 80 to about 5 beats a minute. They lose a lot of body fat. And then the males in February come out and say, who wants to do it? Right. What's crazy, though, is when they come out, they don't actually do it. They more like make plans for later. It's, They're nervous. It's really weird. And the, uh, the reason why they do this, they literally break hibernation, which can kill them if they do it wrong and the timing's wrong or they don't have enough body fat stored up. They do it because groundhogs are so ornery toward one another. They're really mm. territorial about their food supply and their burrow that they've probably made a lot of enemies and hurt a lot of feelings over the past year. So they come out in February to basically be like, hey, how about you and I just bury the hatchet and I'm going to go back to sleep for a few more weeks. But when I come out, we'll totally do it. And <laughs> I'm going to bury something else. <laughs> and, oh, my God. And uh, they do. There's some sort of agreement uh, and they see each other a few weeks later. The, the groundhog goes back to his burrow, and then he comes out for good. He finishes hibernating in March, and then the, um, the, the groundhog fornication can begin forthwith post-haste. That's right. Isn't that nuts? And That's how ordinary pretty, they are. They yeah. have to come out and make plans for later. Yeah, they need a uh, – uh, well, just that chill time in between to, to really gather themselves and make sure they're up for it. I guess so, yeah. So that's super cute. That's a nice little primer on who these little beasts are. Mm-hmm. But this is about Groundhog Day, the holiday where America shuts down. <laughs> right. Gov- government doesn't do business. The banks are closed. You can't buy a piece of gum <laughs> to save your life. Oh, man, if only. So get that gum on February 1st, everybody. That's right. Uh, but sometime between that point, um, between uh, when America became a place mm-hmm. – in 1887, someone looked at the groundhog and this little hibernation thing that they did, and they said, you know what? We also have this weird tradition that we're going to explain in a second, where we like to try and predict when to plant crops and what the, the weather's going to do here toward the end of winter mm-hmm. in the spring. And let's mash that up into a weird, weird 
day to honor this little thing. Yeah, and that's Groundhog Day. That's where it came from. It's a couple of weird traditions, like you said, mashed together. And the other weird tradition, um, in addition to the groundhog coming out uh, in February, is um, this this tradition of February 2nd being observed as um, kind of this indicator of how much winter is going to be left. And it's based on uh, an astronomical event called the Cross Quarter Day, which was observed by the ancient Celts, the pagans I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. And Cross Quarter Days are pretty interesting in that it's a, it's a day of the year, and there's four of them, that fall between a solstice and an equinox. And um, you have uh, a solstice is where the sun is either at the most northerly or southerly part of the sky, um, depending on what hemisphere you're in. So it's either summer or winter, solstice. And then the equinox is where the equator of the earth and the equator of the sun are on an equal plane, just for a minute, just for a moment, I should say. Um, and you have your vernal or spring and autumnal fall equinox. Um, so those are four quarter dates. And then in between those are four cross quarter dates that carve up the, I guess the year even further. And to the ancient Celts, it seems like to them, the cross quarter dates weren't the midway point of anything. They were the beginning point. Whereas to us, the quarter dates, the solstices and the equinox are the beginning of the seasons. The Celts didn't see it that way. And so they really celebrated the cross quarter dates. Yeah, it's kind of like, I guess an American might see them as sort of a seasonal hump day mm -hmm. where you're kind of smack dab in the middle of things. And uh, we don't observe them like they do, but I feel like just in instinctively in sort of early to mid-February every year, late January, my psyche sort of starts to think about, all right, we're, we're easing towards spring. I feel like we're about halfway there. Right. That's and the, this is in Atlanta even. That's the ancient pagan blood coursing through your veins. <laughs> it might be. I think we're we're pagans. But yeah, but to the pagans, it, was, it wasn't like the halfway point. It was the beginning. So in, on February 2nd, this cross-quarter day, it was actually a day called, um, well, it was called a number of things. But to the Celts, it was, uh, it was the beginning of spring. Um, at first, they called it uh, Imbolg which means in the belly, like the the world, the earth is pregnant and about to give birth from into spring. Um, I like that. Yeah. It was when the lambing season began, which— I don't think I like that. No, no, you do. If you, if oh, you do. look up lambing pictures, it's like that's when all the baby lambs are born and hopping around. Oh, I thought it might be when they're harvested. That's what I thought, too. And, and uh, <laughs> no, that probably comes a, a little bit later, but um, this is when everything's still cute and sweet. Oh, okay. They also called it um, uh, Brigantia um, after the the after Brigid, the female deity of light, and the whole point was that you know the sun had really kind of been hiding for most of the winter ever since the uh, winter solstice, and now it was starting to kind of creep out and. To those of us who are like, this is the halfway point, it's kind of like, come on, son, keep going. And when the Christians got their hands on the Celts, the pagans, um, they said, well, how about this? Let's call this like the Festival of Lights, and we'll commemorate that this is like um, a the part of winter where it's starting to get sunnier and sunnier by having you guys bring your candles around the church, and we're going to bless them, and then they'll just keep burning for the rest of the winter. How about that? That's right. They turned them into magic candles. Uh, it became uh, known not only as Festival of Lights, but Candlemas. And you'll hear that word a, a few times mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of still grounded in seasons, though. And the whole thing here is like, as far as the ancient Celts go, and then, you know, people since then, farmers, namely, is when can we, when is the weather going to turn here? When is that ground going to thaw? When can we expect good weather and not be fooled into planting only to have it frost again and kill those early buds. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that it, you, now that you're, you've are you taken up uh, gardening and stuff at your house, mm -hmm. you will be frustrated by this now too, my friend, when that happens. Oh, yeah, the frost, the early frost, or late frost, I should say. The sure. late frost, I'm it's scared the to worst. death of it. I can't sleep. <laughs> well, Emily always, like, when things start blooming too early, she's like, no, stop, stop. Yeah, I know. And like I, it's gonna frost again. It always does. I had to. Uh, I had to stop myself. No, 
I failed to stop myself. I fertilized too late in the season, and um, and I had a, a big problem with that. <laughs> Man, my you anecdotes <laughs> have just really gone downhill in the last 12 years. I predicted your uh, your gardening way back in the day. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, in what episode? How gardening I works? I don't know. So, someone's going to have to find it, but you kind of— you kind of tease me, and I said, you're going to get into it one day, trust me. And you're like, meh. I, I, I tease happen. you? That doesn't sound like me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, this sounds sort like of a gardening me. thing. <laughs> huh, yeah. I, I'm actually surprised at that, but I'll take your word for it. I, I do want to know, so anybody out there, if you know what Chuck's talking about, let us know what episode it is. And a timestamp would be great, too. Someone else, <laughs> so he can erase it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. So, uh, like I said, they were trying to figure out when to plant. And uh, it was not a good omen if it was bright and sunny, because that was a sign of snow and a late frost to, or, to continue on. And that would not be a good time to plant. And this is all a little confusing. Yeah. If, if I'm being honest. Yeah. So, like, the the whole thing was if at Candlemas, um, uh, February 2nd, if if it was if that day was nice out, if the sun was shining, if there were no clouds in the sky, that actually meant that there was going to be a much longer period of winter left. And the reason why that kind of makes sense from a farmer's standpoint is one, maybe you're saying, well, this portends a growing season where it's just going to be nice out and there's not going to be any rain. You don't want that. But also number two, it's like you said, and th- like that kind of weather might fool the plants into starting to grow again and then bam, they get hit with a late frost. So even though it seems counterintuitive, if it's nice out on February 2nd, at Candlemas, to the ancient Celts, that meant that there was more winter coming. If it was the opposite, if it was overcast, maybe even storming, if it was just gross out, it meant that winter was almost over, that the, the, it was more than halfway over and you were probably going to see spring pretty, pretty soon. So that is the initial, um, the initial way that February 2nd kind of plays into this whole thing. So you know what my problem with this is? What? Is... Uh, and you you put this one together, and you kind of came up with some other signs found in nature in different cultures where they sort of look to um, th- the natural world to kind of tell the future. Right. Like the widths of the bands of a woolly caterpillar, mm-hmm. uh, the size and number of webs a spider might spin in the fall. Yeah. Um, how the squirrels are gather- uh, gathering their nuts. <laughs> like, would you or, call it frantic or calm? <laughs> or when the geese depart from the north. How thick corn husks are at harvest. Like, <laughs> I love all that that stuff because to me that is like pre science science. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think all of that stuff is kind of rooted in some maybe it might be a reach for some, but some sort of scientific basis. And it was just from people observing, which was sort of the first science was yeah. observation. But to me, this one is the least scientific of them all. Because it's just one day. Yeah, it, uh, like it is. It's just one day. Like if it's February 2nd, if it's Candlemas, and this is the condition, then that's your indicator. So yeah, I guess it is the least unscientific pre-science measure of, of what's The most unscientific. To come. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It really is. It's on par with drowning a person as a witch because your your prediction for the the winter didn't come true. The, the woolly caterpillars' bands didn't portend the future after all because there's probably something i don't know about the the caterpillar but i bet you there's some little nugget of science in there yeah as to how their bands grow depending on weather yeah i like the kelt stuff oh man that, that reminds me so i read this article in the new yorker not too long ago um and it's about we got to do an episode on it there's this lake a little lake way up in the himalayas in the middle of nowhere in this really dangerous pass and there's always been a bunch of skeletons jumbled together at the bottom of this lake and you can clearly see them so anthropologists went in and grabbed these these skeletons or some of them to take samples and it turns out some of them seem to be from southern italy um maybe even from greece 
from the Mediterranean. They have no business whatsoever. And where is it? Up in the Himalayas, like in Nepal. Oh, wow. Right? On a, just along, a, 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 I think, a Hindu or a Buddhist pilgrimage path. Um, and, it, like, it's just really bizarre that they're there. But the author took some time to just kind of go off on the side and talk about how there was the spread of this group from the steppes of Russia uh, many, many thousands of years ago. They basically brought the Indo-European language our way, but also were super patriarchal, super rapey, um, super murdery. And they really had an impact. You can tell a lasting impact today in how just humans operate. But apparently in Western Europe and including the British Isles, the Celts seemed to be much more peaceful, much more egalitarian. Um, hmm. Women held much more powerful roles than, than they did uh, under this other group. And it really kind of drove home like, wow, like history could have gone a totally different direction. And like, where would we be right now if that other group hadn't come out of the steps and dominated the rest of Europe and just basically wow. changed this like um, fertility worshiping nature cult into you know this hierarchical patriarchal um, murderous civilization that's basically Western civilization today. I think the uh, people in the movie Midsummer would agree with you. That was a good movie. That I, I kept thinking about that as well during this. Of course, I, I watched that again and had a, a better feeling about it. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't love it the first time. Some crazy folk horror, man. Like yeah. it is really something else. I, I totally. have only seen it once. I, I need to see it again. Well, maybe you won't like it the second time. I hope that's not true, but it's possible. <laughs> All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. Okay. We're going to regather ourselves. Okay. And we're going to bring it back to February 2nd right after this. <laughs> All right, so we set up uh, what was going on back in the day, and Groundhog Day is just something that survived from that ancient practice back then. Uh, especially in Germany, they had a tradition of waking up a badger, <laughs> not probably not a good idea, mm -hmm. and seeing if it would crawl back into its burrow uh, to see if it was a sign of bad weather ahead. And then that eventually makes it over to the United States. Some people in Pennsylvania that settled Pennsylvania took that idea, adapted it to groundhogs, I guess, because there were more groundhogs than badgers. Right. And started looking uh, at these groundhogs coming out and whether or not they would see their shadow well, or yeah, whether or not the people would see the shadow. It was the Germans who came over who said, well, wait, there's no badgers. So how are we going to tell about the whether there's winter left or not? And they said, well, groundhogs will do, I guess. And and the the fact that, like, they were present and then brought the superstition with them that was based on this combination of badgers coming out of their burrow and going back and then candle moss and the fact that there weren't any badgers and groundhogs will have to do, that's where Groundhog Day came from. Isn't that bizarre? It is. Uh, but if you really want to talk about Groundhog Day and what we know as Groundhog Day, the sort of goofy, fun, um, money-making scheme— <laughs> <laughs> that they came up with is it can be traced back to one dude, uh, February 2nd, 1887, the very first Groundhog Day celebration um, was created by Climber Fries, F-R-E-A-S, mm -hmm. uh, the editor of the Punxsutawney Spirit newspaper. And Punxsutawney is about 80 miles from Pittsburgh. Um, they're in western Pennsylvania. It's a coal mining town. And it's a very small town. I think its indigenous name from the uh, Native American peoples was Town of the Sandflies. Yeah, the Lenape. Did they have sandflies? Did they I, have sand? I guess. I don't know why else the Lenape would have called it that. And I was like, sandflies don't sound great. Keep people out of there. Sandflies are terrible. Not only does their bite hurt, but they spread all sorts of diseases too. And Punxsutawney basically means sandfly town. So I guess there was a real sandfly problem there at some point. But there's no sand. 
This is Western Pennsylvania. Did they have sand there? I, I think a lot of the United States was marshy before we okay. started developing it. So there's probably a lot of marsh around Western Pennsylvania at the time. I thought they just might have really liked to the settlement and it's, it'd be like naming something like <laughs> home of the bed bug or something. Isn't that why Iceland is called Iceland? Isn't that the old story that they basically wanted to oh, make really? people? Either that or else they, the settlers of Greenland wanted to make Iceland look bad and Greenland look good. So they called Iceland Iceland. Something like that. I mean, that's one of the first little things you hear in elementary school from that guy. Right. He's, Did you know that Iceland is green and Greenland is icy? That's right. I remember. I remember giving that kid a wedgie. Oh, wait. <laughs> I was the kid who got the wedgie. Oh, okay. Makes a lot more sense, huh? So here we are in 1887, and Climber Freeze has stumbled upon a great little moneymaker to bring – Thousands of people to his town to spend money. Actually, he he started it a year before that, just ever so briefly. He just, as the publisher of the Punxsutawney Spirit, he published a line that said, Today is Groundhog Day, and up to the time of going to press, the beast has not seen its shadow. And the fact that he he's doesn't spend any see. time explaining <laughs> what he's talking about yeah. suggests that it was already pretty well established, at least in the town of Punxsutawney at the time, probably in western Pennsylvania, what with their large German and large groundhog population. Um, and that was it. That was the first mention in a newspaper in America of Groundhog Day. And because Groundhog Day is a specifically American invention based on ancient Celtic and, and German um, traditions, uh, this would be the first time in the world anyone ever mentioned it in a paper. So he plants that seed. He wants to get a buzz going. He's like, I'm going to tease this out over a year. Mm -hmm. No one's going to know what's coming. No one's going to know what hit him in 1887. And in that year uh, that he was sort of, the idea was brewing, he founded, he got some folks together, uh, Groundhog Hunters, and called it the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club and, that would become that in 1899. And they were groundhog hunters. Groundhogs were pests, and they would go around, kill groundhogs. Uh, apparently, they would eat them. Mm -hmm. It was a delicacy that they served to out-of-towners at first, I <laughs> right. guess, so here you guinea pigs, just to see if they died. Yeah. And then the locals started eating groundhogs, which I can't imagine tastes very good. No, but that's hilarious that the tradition of Groundhog Day grew out of these people eating groundhogs, like groundhog hunters. Terrible. Terrible, but also hilarious. And the sure. fact that they served them to out-of-towners first also just really gets me. But this this Punxsutawney Groundhog Club, um, they held the first um, Groundhog Day in 1887, as you were saying before. And I don't, I could not find to save my life why they chose Gobbler's Knob. Um, but there may be a clue in why Gobbler's Knob is named that. There's two um, possible reasons given. One is that the, I guess it was a hangout for turkeys, which okay, great. Um, or it was the place that traditionally groundhog hunters or hunters of any woodland animal would kind of come out of the woods to this hilly area and eat what they had just caught or cook and eat what they just caught, possibly having picnics in the area. So it would make sense that the groundhog club would go to Gobbler's Knob where they would normally eat groundhog if this was already associated with groundhogs in that way. But either way, that's where they held it's Picturesque. The, yeah, picturesque and um, bloody. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it makes sense to have a thing there is what I'm saying. Right, right. So, right, yeah, it is quite beautiful. But that's where the first Groundhog Day in 1887 was held, and it has been basically ever since. I mean, there was a stretch here or there where they didn't do it, but as they were first starting to get their footings. But I think from the turn of the last century onward, it's been at uh, Gobbler's Knob every year. Yeah, and I think of that first one, uh, the Groundhog saw his shadow. Yeah. And for parts of the area, and this is kind of how it goes, of course, with something that's unscientific. Right. Parts of the area had, uh, it worked out. Parts of the area, it did not work out as far as winter uh, ending sooner than later. <laughs> well, I think that's kind of par for the course for, sure. for Phil, as we'll see. And so, um, although we can thank, like, Climber Freeze for giving us Groundhog Day. Like I said, like it's clear this was already an established tradition. And I think the earliest mention they've been able to find of somebody referencing Groundhog Day goes back to 1841, where a guy named James Morris wrote in his diary about, he mentioned Groundhog Day. Um, and I don't think he said 
whether the groundhog saw a shadow or not. He just mentions it and kind of describes it. So it had been around for many decades before Climber Freeze came along with it, but Climber Freeze was definitely the one to, to popularize it. Yeah, I mean, he started writing about it and writing about the, you know, this amazing groundhog that could foretell the future weather. And, you know, it's all tongue-in-cheek and good fun. Um, we have to talk about Punxsutawney Phil, of course, mm -hmm. the famous groundhog that is still uh, the groundhog of record in Punxsutawney. Full name, Punxsutawney Phil, seer of seers, sage of sages, prognosticator of prognosticators, and weather prophet extraordinary is <laughs> Phil's full name. That's right. And it's very cute. I guess he wasn't named Phil until, I don't know, the the first half or the mid middle of the last century um, because the um, the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club on their website says that he is named after King Philip. And King Philip is not, I don't think, who they're talking about. I think they're referencing Prince Philip, who mm -hmm. is Queen Elizabeth's husband. And he wouldn't have really become a, a, a public figure until, you know— the 30s, maybe the 40s or 50s. So before that, <laughs> um, the groundhog, you know, that stretch. Um, yeah. But the groundhog uh, was known as uh, Brer Groundhog, Brother Groundhog, or Brother Groundhog. That's what they all called him before. But the thing about Punxsutawney Phil, which is what he's named now, he may have had different names, but the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club maintains that he's still the same groundhog that they, the the group came upon back in 1887. That is this magically living, long-living groundhog who's been alive for, I guess now, 133 years since that first Groundhog Day in 1887. Right. So, you know, we said earlier to put a pin in the fact that groundhogs live, what was it, like six to eight years or something like something that? Like that? Ten in captivity. Sure. Well, he's in captivity. Mm-hmm. But 133 it seems is like a way beyond that. <laughs> yeah. So they uh, they cooked up a fun little story there. Uh, they said that Phil is able to live so long because um, he drinks a punch made of dandelions every summer. Mm -hmm. And I think they saw the writing on the wall and said, hey, <laughs> we can make another money-making day out of this thing mm -hmm. if we have a little summer festival picnic thing where Phil drinks this uh, – dandelion juice, as it were. And so now they have a big celebration for Phil's uh, annual drinking of the daisy juice. Right. And, or dandelion juice. And we mentioned that, you know, back years back, the groundhog was treated as a pest and eaten, hunted and eaten, and that they may have had like a picnic around Gobbler's Knob to eat the groundhogs. This annual tradition now where they all celebrate uh, Phil gaining seven more years to his life seems to have been based on the annual groundhog hunt and roast. So they went from eating groundhogs to pretending that this one is, is has been alive for 133 years thanks to this this magical potion that he drinks. I wonder if they make great efforts to get a groundhog that really looks like the original Phil. I think groundhogs look a lot alike to humans. Yeah. You know? Sure. But it's like Ugga for the Georgia Bulldogs. Like, they have different Uggas. Right. And white Bulldogs, you know, they all, all the Uggas look a little bit different. And we all, like, that's part of the personality of, of each Ugga. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think uh, the groundhogs, you're saying they just, like, he didn't have a big white stripe down the middle of his head or anything. I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, they've got to. Because it's, you know, the thing about the Uggas is, you know, it's Ugga 6 or that's Ugga million or something yeah. like that. Like, they're meant to be, they're different Uggas, but they're all related in some way, at least through school spirit. Um, this is supposed to be all of the successive groundhogs, whenever they come upon, you know, him in his burrow and he's not moving any longer. Um, it, like, the yeah, they would, I guess, kind of have to find a groundhog Keep that looks kind of like him. <laughs> Yeah. That, so that they can be like, well, this is the this is the same one. He's been around for 133 years. All I'm saying is it's probably not very hard to pull the wool over human beings' eyes when they're like, no, it's the same groundhog. <laughs> you know? I think I think the Uggas are all the same family line, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? I don't know if all of them in history, but I think there's this very prominent Savannah family that 
uh, where all the Uggas come from, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't um, I should know this. the main guy, the guy who was on trial in Midnight of the Garden of Good and Evil, wasn't he the Ugga breeder for a while? I don't know, but it had something to do with that. I feel like he he had something. Yeah, he had something to do with the Uggas, and if if not, like the actual the owner of the the Uggas mom or something. Yeah, pretty good movie. I never read the book. I did both, and they were both pretty good. It was one of those ones yeah. where like the movies. Just about as good as the book. Back when you could watch a Kevin Spacey movie. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Creeped out. <laughs> yep. And John Cusack uh, does a good job too. <laughs> That's right. And you could watch a John Cusack movie and not be creeped out. <laughs> so let's take uh, let's take a break here and we'll talk about, you know, we mentioned that uh, if, when Phil dies in the dead of night, they have to get him out of there quietly. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll talk about how they might do that right after this. <laughs> Okay, so we're back and we have a dead groundhog on our hands. Yeah, well, if Punxsutawney Phil passes away, which has clearly happened, Mm -hmm. Probably ever every eight to ten years, yeah. uh, they can do so quietly because Phil leads a very pampered life, uh, an indoor life, you might say. Oh yeah, cushy. Because uh, he has handlers, he has a, a full sort of staff of volunteers that look after Phil, and they all have funny titles like Shingle Shaker or Chief uh, Chief Health Man, and uh, they they make sure Phil leads a pretty cush life there in captivity. I've read that he eats a lot of ice cream and actually had to have Ooh. a tooth removed once because he had a cavity from eating so much sugar. Aww, poor so, guy. Yeah, he's he's basically kept very happy um, and strung out on junk food, I guess. Um, <laughs> but that inner circle that you mentioned, that's 15 local volunteers who basically, they're not the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club. They're like the the... Upper Echelon, the leaders of the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club, it sounds like. And only a couple of them are allowed to handle Phil. Um, And the president is the only one who actually can communicate with Phil, as we'll see. (laughs) Yeah, they, uh, and we'll talk about the movie in a bit, but if you've seen the movie, you've seen those tuxedos and top hats. Or if you, you know, you got the day off of work anyway, if you tune in to watch the coverage you're going to see those tuxedos and top hats because they say, hey, Phil's a VIP. When VIPs came to town back in the day, this is what we'd wear when we met him at the train. And he is our most famous resident, so we're going to pay him that respect. Well, the other thing that I saw, the other explanation I saw, and that explanation actually came from one of the former Inner Circle members. But another explanation is that some of those early, like, um, 19th century depictions of Brer Groundhog um, was in a top hat. Like, he was supposed to be this very intelligent um, uh, forecaster of of weather. Um, And so they would depict him in, like, a top hat. And I think that's probably likelier where it came from, and they just forgot somewhere along the way. Oh. Well, Phil does a lot of sleeping. Um, He does not hibernate, though, because he, like I said, he's in his uh, his climate controlled burrow. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have these cues from nature to let him know when anything is at all. Uh, he, he, as far as he knows, it's always perfect weather, except every February when he gets yanked out of there, <laughs> taken out in the cold in the middle of the night to his other, thankfully, climate controlled burrow mm-hmm. that is built into a stump. Uh, if you've never seen it, you can just uh, Google an image of this. Um, kind of nice scene. It's got a stage there and a stump, and it's, you know, it looks like something you'd see at a, uh, like a, a show at Six Flags or something. That's exactly right. The Country Bears Jamboree or something. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's great. I couldn't quite put my finger on what it looked like, but that is exactly what I was thinking <laughs> of and couldn't find it. So um, it's a bit of a rude awakening. Like you said, it's the middle of the night for Phil, but they give him some time to kind of relax and, like, get settled into his his um, stump, his showtime stump, I guess is what you call it. <laughs> sure. But I can't imagine that he's, like, getting a lot of relaxation in because just outside of that stump is anywhere from, I, I've seen 8,000 up to 20,000 people 
all wow. hanging out on Gobbler's Knob. And this is in a town of about 5,000 people. So the population might be quadrupled depending on whether Groundhog Day, say, falls on a weekend. And they are so loud. They're, it's a rowdy, boisterous crowd. Um, they shoot off fireworks. They have live music all throughout the night. This is all leading up to dawn, basically. From about 3 a.m. to about 6.30 a.m., they just are partying right outside of Phil's stump. And then fi- I wonder if there's a drink, like a signature drink. I like saw the that there's Derby. A, yeah, I saw there's a groundhog punch that has to do okay. with like vodka and a bunch of other stuff. But sure. I also have a distinct impression that this might be, if not dry, at least Ooh. way more family friendly than you yeah. know, everybody wasted on punch kind of thing. No, that's true. I mean you don't want to you don't want it to be like uh well like the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> Dude Man, things get dark there real quick. <laughs> You've been to one of those, right? Yeah, and it got dark there real quick. <laughs> Man, that was like— Like the second the race is over? Yeah, and even, no, before, during, <laughs> right after yeah. is just utter chaos. You mean I were like, we we didn't leave, we fled. It was yeah. crazy, dude. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I get the funny. impression that this is a lot more um, clean cut than than the Kentucky Derby. I feel I, when I saw fireworks, I just felt bad for Phil. That can't yeah. be. Uh, he must have been scared for sure. And I'm sure all the the dogs in the area are like, I hate Groundhog Day. Yeah, you know, and no and good. You know, neighbors that aren't really big on Groundhog Day are probably not very happy. I mean, but yeah, well, that, you go out of town, you Airbnb your place. That's what you do. I would guess so, because again, yeah. five thousand people live in town. 20,000 additional people show up. And hopefully, if you own a business, you've listened to Chuck and your business is open that day. (laughs) So you mentioned uh, the president is the only one who can speak to Phil or understand Phil. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, When Phil emerges from that burrow, he does speak. um, Groundhog ease is what they call it. And the president is the only person, even in that inner circle, that can understand and translate for the people. And Phil is, is kind of a rapper. Isn't that right? I think that's being rather generous, but yes, he okay. he speaks in rhyme, kind of a sing song rhyme. Yeah. Well, I mean, it looks like a rap to me on this Groundhog Day. I'm happy to say, <laughs> I love fruity pebbles in a major way. <laughs> was that a commercial? Yes, it was. Oh, okay. Ironically, well, I guess the opposite of ironically, expectedly, a um, fruity pebbles commercial. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so he speaks in sing song. Uh, the president uh, translates for everyone. They all have a good time. And keep in mind, this is at dawn. So mm-hmm. I imagine the whole affair is over pretty quickly. Yeah, they got to be so tired, too. Yeah. Um, but everybody gets powered up by some vodka based groundhog punch. <laughs> sure. They're like, why are we drunk at 8 15? That's right. I think that's kind of the case, at least for some people. But, um, That's the whole shebang. They've kind of stretched it out for a week, I've seen, that the whole festivities kind of take place over the week. But it seems like February 2nd is kind of the big day, February 1st slash 2nd. Um, So is he accurate, though? That's the question. the, The answer to that question is no, not at all. Because it's unscientific. Well, yeah, it's definitely unscientific. But somehow Phil is even worse than chance at predicting the weather. Now, the Groundhog Club says he's he's correct 100% of the time. Um, that's that whole tongue-in-cheek thing. And then right. some people like to try to prove them right and say, well, yes, in some parts of the country he's right, in other parts he's not. But for the Punxsutawney area, or western Pennsylvania, he's he's – he hits between 30 and 40% on any given 10-year stretch. 40% between 2010 and 2019. 30% between 2001 and 2010. Um, so that's not very good. I mean, like, if you just toss a coin, you could expect to come up heads or tails better than that. And that's basically what they're doing. Um, and we should say, in Phil's defense, he's not predicting anything. This is all the very, very insane inner circle who are making these predictions. So they're technically the ones who are worse than chance at predicting whether there's going to be six more weeks of winter or in early spring. Yeah, Phil didn't want to be there in the first place. (laughs) That's right. There's I saw a footage of one in nineteen ninety seven where he bit the the guy the handler's finger and um, only got some of the glove, but it looked like it would have been pretty vicious had he gotten any of his actual finger. It was hilarious. And the crowd went wild. They loved it. (laughs) He literally bit the hand that feeds him. Yeah, I guess so. He's like, give me some more ice cream. So should we talk about the movie? We can't not talk about the movie. 
Oh, I didn't think we would talk about the movie. <laughs> uh, Groundhog Day, uh, a movie which I have covered on Movie Crush. <laughs> this was the favorite movie of uh, Griffin McElroy of the famous McElroy Brothers podcasting. I saw family. that. I thought it was Justin McElroy. Was it Griffin? No, Justin, he was on two, though. He did uh, With Nail and I, mm-hmm. another great movie. Okay. And uh, Griffin picked picked Groundhog Day, and he says Griffin's quote was, not only do I think it's my favorite movie, he said, I think it's the best movie. <laughs> like, good. literally the best movie it ever like made. like he had some <laughs> Groundhog Punch himself. He loves it, and uh, and I love it. It's a little, you know, it, it doesn't age super well. Kind of, It's a little problematic. Is it? Um, oh, like yeah, is it kind of chauvinistic? Bill Murray's a little, he's a little, he's just a little aggressive. He he doesn't take no for an answer over and over and gotcha, over again. Gotcha. And that's the point of the movie. But watching it through today's lens is sort of like, hey, back off, dude. She's not interested. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you know? yeah, I get you. Um, so the the for those of you who haven't seen it, first of all, go see it. But then secondly, it's it's um, about this reporter who gets stuck in this time loop where he's living February 2nd, Groundhog Day, in Punxsutawney over and over and over again. Um, and his name is Phil. And it had such a huge impact, yeah. And they never explain why this happens. It just happens to him, which I think is uh, something that makes the movie that much more enjoyable. But yeah. um, <clears throat> the 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 this movie had such an impact on... Um, the culture that today people associate Groundhog Day not just with, you know, predicting whether there's going to be an early spring or more winter. They predict it with weird things like losing track of time or time yeah. doing odd things or having deja vu. And that's strictly from the movie. Like, that was never oh, yeah. a part of Groundhog Day until this 1993 movie came along. Yeah, I mean, people will say that <clears throat> if something happened again to you or whatever, you say, oh, man, it's like Groundhog Day. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty rare for a movie to enter the sort of public consciousness to that degree. Um, and also it is interesting. And displace something that's already taking that spot even, you know what I'm right. saying? Or uh, add to it at least. Yeah, for sure. Um, when I was doing research for the Movie Crush episode, uh, I did see that thing that you included here that the original screenwriter and eventual co-writer uh, to Harold Ramis, Danny Rubin, um, the original script, it was 10,000 years um, that he was living mm-hmm. because of the Buddhist principle that it takes 10,000 years for a human soul to be perfect. And they changed that up in the movie. And there is a lot of robust debate about how many days occur in the movie. Uh-huh. Um, supposedly, and I looked this up in a bunch of different places, if you just look at the movie, the number of times it repeats is 38 Okay, I saw 23. Uh, but if there are people who have taken time to calculate how long it really is, because, you know, he learns foreign languages, mm-hmm. he becomes a master piano player, mm-hmm. uh, and, and people have taken great lengths to actually calculate how long it would take to do all this. And everyone, I mean, there are some exact days that people have calculated, but everyone has sort of landed in the neighborhood of about 10 years including Harold Ramis saying, yeah, we feel like it's about 10 years that he's relived in order to learn all this stuff. I like 10,000 more. I'm going 10, with Danny is- Rubin's <laughs> estimate, you know? Well, if it was 10,000 years, he would just be like, it'd be like in the Matrix at the end or something. Well, at some point he says, I'm a god. So, yeah, that's true. You know, maybe it still is in there. But, um Yeah. Uh, the one of the things about that movie too, Chuck, is um, it's part of the festivities now. They show it the night before at yeah, like course. the local theater, <clears throat> and um, it's been a boon for the town as well. Not just Groundhog Day, but the movie itself has drawn people to the town to kind of see, you know, Punxsutawney, and they're usually very disappointed to find out that they didn't actually shoot the town in Punxsutawney. They shot it in Woodstock, Illinois. So while they named, like, the businesses and took, like, cop cars from Punxsutawney and, like, moved a lot of Punxsutawney to Woodstock, you can't visually see, like, oh, this is where this, this you know, this is where Ned Ryerson crosses the street um, to say hi, uh, you no. know, downtown. <laughs> like, that's in Woodstock, Illinois. So I think they don't tell people that until after they've made their way to Punxsutawney and spent at least $50. Then they tell them, okay— it's Woodstock, Illinois that you're really after. 
Yeah. I mean, what do you think? Do you want to go to Punxsutawney and kind of be at the real place? Or do you want to go to Illinois to kind of see these real movie locations? I would like to go to neither of those places. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm good with just right. seeing clips, old clips um, on YouTube. That's fine with me. Like, it's never struck me as like a great um, uh, holiday. I think not because of Groundhog Day or the fact that it's in Western Pennsylvania or anything like that, um, but because February second is just such a sucky time of the year. I hate that time of the year. Um, that nothing really good can happen around then. So. You know, the beginning of February always stinks, which is ironic because my wedding anniversary is in mid-February. That, to me, is when things pick up. Yeah. I pulled that out at the end, didn't I? <laughs> you did. I forgot you guys got, you got married uh, in warm climes. Yeah, though, we, so. we escaped to Hawaii. Yeah. Because February is kind of gross in the United States. Yeah. My anniversary is sometime in late April. I can never remember the day. <laughs> <laughs> 20-something. Well, hey, just start saying after this, we'll just say all the different numbers. We'll find out the right one, and then Jerry can edit it in. All right. Um, you uh, you got anything else? I got nothing else. Um, well, if you want to know more about Groundhog Day, just go online. I think this year it's 100% streaming. They're, they're, because of COVID, they're not having people out, uh, but they are streaming it. So you can go check out the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club's website for all the links and everything. And since I directed everyone to the Punxsutawney Groundhog Club's website, as per usual, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this hot off the presses. This came in 30 seconds ago. Oh, boy. And I didn't have one prepared, and this is a good one. Uh, Hey, guys, hope you're doing well. Uh, Josh, Chuck, and Jerry over there. My name is Mike Martin. He, him, his. Thank you for that, Mike. Mm -hmm. I'm a classical musician, a bassist in the New World Symphony in Miami Beach, Florida. Been an avid listener for six years. My sister Jessica got me hooked on your show after we were traveling to see our family. Got stuck behind an oil tanker. The truck pulled to a stop on a quiet stretch of highway, uh, rural, in the middle of the night when the driver put on the hazards, jumped out of the vehicle, confused. We attempted to go around when the hood of the truck burst into flames. Wow. After backing away to a safe distance, my sister laughed. Uh, side pulled out her phone and said, looks like we're not going anywhere. Have you heard of stuff you should know? Nice. Uh, since then, I've listened to your entire catalog five times. Wow, Mike, that's about that? amazing. So this is a long email, but I'm going to get to the crux of it here. It was about the Klan episode uh, and his experience as a black man. Uh, he said, I really appreciate your recent episode on the KKK, especially what Chuck mentioned about feeling a need to do a comprehensive dive on the Klan because of the terror and harm they visited on black Americans like myself. I'm 26 years old, and even when I was a young child in the 90s, there were cross burnings near my home in semi-rural Pennsylvania. Uh, We moved a few towns over not long afterwards, but all my life as a black child living in the Northeast, I lived with explicitly racist iconography. Uh, On walks with friends in the woods, we'd find swastikas and racist screeds spray-painted on abandoned railroad buildings, It was not uncommon to see Confederate flags on people's homes and cars. Even in school, I'd find nooses tied on the pull cords of blinds. I even remember the first time I was called the N-word in a school bathroom in the first grade and the principal's response to my parents in his office. We can't help what people teach their kids at home. Mm -mm -mm. Man. Uh, The way I was treated improved as I got older, but it prompted me to start thinking about how the more insidious and subtle elements of racism impact my life and those of others from a very young age. And then uh, Mike went on to give a lot of great recommendations for episodes he thinks we should do. Uh, And he says, stay safe and be well. And that is from Mike Martin, the bass player. Nice, Mike. Thanks a lot for writing in. I'm sorry all of that could happen to you. Yeah. Um, And yeah, thanks for the ideas. Give me an idea that he he gave us for an episode. He said jazz uh, because he said it, it... it's a lot of different things that we've talked about um, kind of coming together uh, in a musical movement. So that's one that we've talked about. It's just, geez, like Ken Burns did however many hours on jazz. How do we do 45 minutes on jazz? Whatever. We did a two-parter on Evil Knievel. We can do anything. Bebop, scoot up, dude. You just do that the whole time. <laughs> All right? Maybe we shouldn't do one on jazz now that I think about it. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> 
Uh, well, if you want to get in touch with us like Mike did and share the horrors of your childhood, we want to hear that uh, in a weird way um, and also to share it with the rest of you so we can all feel like a Stuff You Should Know family even more than we did before. Uh, and you can wrap it up, spank it on the bottom uh, gently and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.